All right, Claire. All earthly things with earth will fade away, but prayer grasps eternity. But I'm convinced of this, God does not hear prayer. He hears desperate prayer. Prayer is not a position, whether you need. Prayer is not a position, it's a disposition. You get to the place where you'd rather sweat, you'd rather weep in his presence than laugh in anybody else's presence. You'd rather God whisper a secret into your heart that breaks you. Than somebody give you the prizes that all the world covets. Prayer is almost the greatest human privilege that we have. Now, true, I love that line in there that says, uh, you'd rather sweat, you'd rather weep in his presence than be in anybody else's presence. Amen? Amen. How many guys, just, just for you, that's real today, yeah? Um, guys, I, I wanna, uh, I'm excited for today's sermon. We're going to close out our prayers in the psalm series today. And uh, we're going to be doing uh, what was actually my favorite psalm in the Bible, Psalm 24. And uh, so I'm delighted to be able to preach it to you. But um, I want you to keep in mind what it is that we just experienced. Yes? Um, how beautiful is it, church, that we get to come together into the presence of Almighty God? Come on. I mean, how grateful are we that, that, that God receives the worship from people like you and me, yes? That we get to come in this house and we get to sense the nearness of Christ. And, and here's the reality, church. We believe wholeheartedly this reality, that we are changed and transformed in the presence of God. Amen? When, when, when people encounter the presence of the living God, guys, you don't leave there unchanged, but the Lord starts to move in you. He starts to transform you. He starts to conform you to the image of his son, Jesus. And so we believe in, in coming together to just express our heart to Jesus and worship through song because we know in doing so he's moving and he's worthy. Amen? And so I want you to keep that in mind as we go into this psalm, because this psalm really is one about the presence of the Lord. It's about coming in hungry for the presence of the Lord. And truly this, how do people like you and me come into the presence of Almighty God? Yes, it's a powerful question. And so I want us to pray. I want us to get going here. And we come into uh, the presence of the Lord through his word right now. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for being here with us. God, we thank you for moments like this where we can come and just worship you and praise your name. And God, in, the, in that doing, Lord, we just sense the nearness of you in a whole fresh way. God, I praise you for that. God, I pray this morning over my brothers and sisters in this room that you would just begin to work in our heart right now in this moment. God, that you'd open up our hearts to hear you, Lord, to hear your word. God, you'd open our eyes to see you. I don't want this to miss us. I don't want this to go over us, God. I want this to be transformational for us today. And so I pray, Lord, that we would see you high and lifted up right now. God, that our hearts would just tune into that reality. Lord, I don't know what my brothers and sisters are experiencing right now, God, in their life. Maybe it feels right now like their world is a little chaotic and out of control. But God, we recognize right now one reality that you are in control, that you are on the throne, that all things go through you, Lord. And so we look to you right now. God, I pray that you would be close to us right now. I pray you draw us in to your holy presence through the power of your spirit because of your son, Jesus Christ. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen? Yeah. Amen, church. Awesome, awesome. All right, hey, grab a Bible if you don't have one. We have Bibles up here. You can grab one. Turn to Psalm 24. And uh, listen, if you don't have a Bible, take one home with you, okay? We are delighted to just put out new Bibles every week, all right? So good, grab one. It's not stealing if you're stealing the word of God, okay? You heard it here first. You're good. All right. Uh, listen, grab that. Turn to Psalm 24. Um, the background of Psalm 24 is most likely, scholars kind of believe that this is most likely when the Ark of the Covenant was being returned to Israel, to Jerusalem, to the temple through David, okay, through King David. You can read about that story in 2 Samuel chapter 6. But in that story, it's this profound movement, this profound celebration, because the Ark of the Covenant represented the presence of God God to the people of Israel. Yeah, think about that for a minute. When it was taken captive, when Babylon came and seized it, you know what happened? Women began to weep, and they named it, they said, they said the glory of the Lord has left us. A significant, this symbol they have of the presence of God dwelling with them, being with them, was stolen and taken out of their nation, and therefore it was as if the glory of God had left 
And so on this day, when it's coming back in, there is massive celebration. There's a, a just beautiful singing and dancing and longing because these people were hungry for one thing, church. You know what that is? They were desperate for the presence of the Lord. They wanted the presence of God to come again and fill their nation and fill their homes and fill their families. And so they were longing for this moment. And so David opens up this psalm by praising God, okay? You know why he praises him? Because of his sovereignty over all created things. Look at this, it's beautiful. Verses one and two says this. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and those who dwell therein, for he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Isn't that beautiful? I love the way that NET puts it like this. It's verse one. The Lord, listen to me, owns the earth. Say that with me. The Lord owns the earth and all it contains, the world and all who live in it. For he has set its foundation upon the seas and established it upon the ocean current church. The Lord owns the earth. Amen? Amen. Listen, how many of you guys own homes here today? Yeah, you don't own a home here today, okay? <laughs> that ground that you have underneath your foundation, that ain't your ground, all right? It belongs to the Lord. He owns everything. It's his possession. It belongs to him. And so the house you live in belongs to who? The street you drive on. That's right. It belongs to the Lord. But not only that, not only your things, look what it says. He doesn't just own the earth. He owns all it contains. And listen, all who what? Live in it. It's not just that God owns the ground that you walk on or the streets you drive on, church. He owns the car you drive. He owns the you that you are. Come on. All created things. And here's why. Because God created it. Amen? Look what it says right here in this text, verse 2. For he set the foundation upon the seas and established it upon ocean currents. That word in the Hebrew for foundation is a creational word. It's hearkening back to God creating the heavens and the earth. It says that God created, he set the foundation of the earth, of the world, and everything he made, God created it. Therefore, he's the right owner of it. Yes? How many of you guys have ever created something before in your life? None of you. You made something, come on, out of creation, yes? <laughs> Trick question, I got you guys today, it's easy. Listen, we make something and it's ours inherently, is it not? You patent something that you design, that you develop, it belongs to you. God created, therefore, everything in creation is his. But what's made even clearer about creation in this text is what he says about the seas, because he says that he's set the foundation upon the seas and established it upon ocean currents. I mean, you read that, how many guys recognize that the ground you walk on is not actually set on top of the ocean. Yeah? What's that mean then? Look with me, Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God, what? Created. created. That's foundation. The heavens and the earth. Verse 2. The earth was without form and void. And listen to this. And darkness was over the face of what? Of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of? Why don't you hear that? You've got the face of the deep and the face of the waters. God created out of chaos, out of the mess of what was going on, out of the wickedness running rampant, God created order and beauty and wholeness, didn't he? Listen, church, this has two meanings for you today. The Hebrew people associated the ocean, the seas, with wickedness and chaos. Do you know that? You know waves? How many of you guys have watched the ocean before? Yes? How many of you guys have watched the ocean during a storm? Kind of terrifying, is it not? Those waves are coming and crashing. So for the Hebrew people, the boats would sink, people would drown. It represented evil unchecked all over the earth. The ocean was this limitless force that they couldn't contain. It was too powerful any man to tame the sea, yes? Even today, we can't tame the ocean, can we? We can do a lot of cool things. We can't do that. But it says right here that God made the earth over the seas. Listen to what that means, church. Here's what's fascinating about that. God is not only sovereign, over all of creation, nor just the owner of everything that exists. But he established his rule over all that is evil and chaotic too. He created over the top of chaos and evil. And out of chaos and evil, he brought goodness and he brought wholeness and he brought order because he is sovereign over all that is, which means that he is over evil too. Come on. Some of you guys, you've experienced some evil in your life done to you that you've seen 
I want to remind you today that God is over that evil. He's sovereign in control, isn't he? Church, he has unlimited power and is unmatched by anyone or anything, good or evil. Not beautiful? Church, that anchor was the anchor for David to praise the Lord because Babylon took the ark of God, which was evil, and yet God brought the ark back to the nation. Come on. When evil tries to take the things of God, God can bring it back. Amen? We see that here. And he's greater than it, guys. What he says will happen, his will will be done. Amen? He's holy, he's righteous, he's good, he's all-powerful, he's all-knowing, he's omniscient, he's everywhere at once, and he is totally in control. Come on, he is totally in control. Praise God. And in thinking about that truth, that reality, the total sovereignty, the rule of God, the holiness of God, David is moved then to this logical question, which is this, church. If God is all sovereign and holy and good, who then can come into the presence of Almighty God? Think about that. If God is who he says he is, right? If the ark represents the presence of God and they're bringing that in to Israel, David bringing this ark in, he's going, he's got to ask this question. Who can stand in the presence of Almighty God? Of a God that sovereign, of a God who rules that well, who can come into the presence of sovereign God? And he says it like this, verse three. David says this. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Quite literally, guys, the Israelite people, they're, they're marching the, the Ark of the Covenant, which represents the presence of God. They're taking it through Jerusalem, and they're marching it up the hill to the Temple Mount. And they're going to walk it into the temple, right? So they're truly walking up the hill. They're ascending the hill. But David is asking something more specific than that. Not simply, who can walk up? But is this... Who can go up to the temple of the Lord and worship? Who can do that? Who's capable of doing that? Who's capable of going into the presence of God? That's the question. His question is this, church, who is worthy? Who's worthy? Look what he says, verse four. He who has clean hands and a pure heart who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. What's the answer, church? Who can go into the presence of the Lord? We can sum it up like this. Only those who are righteous. Who can come up? The righteous, church. Listen, what do he say there? He says, you gotta have clean hands. What's clean hands mean? You washed your hands before you came in? How many of you guys actually did that, though, today for real? We wanna know. Okay, good. Okay, not many of you. This is, this is dicey. Um, <laughs> Clean hands, right? What is this? This is an idiom. This is a, this is a metaphor for talking about your actions, right? That, that you're someone who actually lives in holiness, that you do right things with what you do. What you put your hand to, it's upright. It's not sinful. You're not, you're not doing wickedness with your hands, with your actions, right? You have purity in your actions. They're clean before God. How many of you guys can say, that's me today? All right. Pure heart. Pure hearts. What's this? You drank some kind of fluid and, and did a nice cleanse, that kind of thing. Is that what it is? What is this? It means that you have a right attitude and will, yeah? That your desire, your motivation for serving the Lord is actually right. That your actions, not just your actions, this is what the Pharisees got wrong, guys. They had clean hands, but they had wicked hearts. They did the right things, but they were wicked in their heart. They did it for themselves. They did it out of evil intentions. God is saying, no, to come into his presence, you've got to have a pure heart, one that longs to see the Lord, one that is pure in his desire for the Lord. It's not for you, it's for him. Clean hands, pure hearts, and it says, who does not lift up his soul to what is false, church. They don't worship idols. There's no other that sits on the throne in your life. It's God and God alone, and you worship him alone, yes? And then this who does not swear deceitfully. Now, when we hear that, we often think that has to do with lying, and certainly don't go out there and start swearing deceitfully, okay? But if you know the context of what this is talking about, if you look at other psalms and how this phrase is used, what's fascinating is that it's not talking about simply lying. Church, it's talking about covering up our sins. It's talking about the ones who look like they are the part but actually aren't. 
The ones who look like they've got hands clean and a pure heart, who look like they don't bow down to another idol, but truly are hiding that because they still are. They're not false with who they are. They're not false with what they're for and what they're into. Guys, they're honest about that with the Lord. They're not covering up their sins. They're not hiding from the Lord. David's saying the one who can come into the presence of the Lord are those whose actions are right, whose motive is pure, who worships God alone and does not cover up their sins, but actually is righteous. That's who gets to come in. Isn't that amazing? How are we doing? Sounds incredible, right? Like life goals. If that verse could describe me, yes. (laughs) Isn't that how you guys desire to live? Now, how we want to be, right? Clean hands, pure hearts, worship God alone. I'm true to who I am. I'm actually, actually this way that in, in public that I am in private, yes? Here's the question that we must deal with, church. Does that mean I can only come into the presence of God if I have a totally clean and pure heart? That verse. Church, if that were true, then we could never worship and we could never be saved. And yet, those who come into the presence of the Lord must have clean hands and pure hearts, church. How can we as sinners in need of a Savior come into the presence of Almighty, Sovereign God? That's our question today, church. And I would submit to you that we need a category for sinful blamelessness. (laughs) You with me? We need to see this the way God sees us. Psalm 32 uh, is another psalm of David, just a few pages over, where David paints this picture. He says in verse 11, it'll be on your screens for you. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice. Who? Who should rejoice? Who should be glad? Who? Oh, righteous, right? Shout for joy, all you who are upright in heart. Yes, that's who David's talking about. Why? Shout for joy. Have, have, have peace in the Lord. Rejoice him, right? Be glad because you are righteous. How did they become righteous? How? Look at what happens here. Verse 1 and 2 of that same text it says this. Blessed is the one whose transgression is, say it with me, forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Church, when Psalm 32, 11 says, rejoice, you righteous, you know who they're talking about? They're talking about these people right here. These are the righteous ones, the one whose sin is forgiven, the one whose sin has been covered, church. Righteousness doesn't mean sinlessness. It means forgiveness. Come on. The fact that you are righteous has nothing to do with who you are. It has to do with all of who Christ is, and it is because you are forgiven that you can be called righteous. Amen? This is sinless, sinful blamelessness, that while you are still a sinner, Christ makes you righteous because of who he is. Church, come on. Look what it says. It says the same thing in Psalm 24. Watch this, verse 5. He will receive blessing from the Lord. What's the blessing? Look at this. And righteousness from the God of his salvation. <laughs> He will receive blessing from Yahweh and the righteousness from God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Church, the blessing, the one who comes eagerly before the Lord receives, is the very righteousness from God. You can't come into the throne room of the Lord without the righteousness of Almighty God. And yet God is blessing those who seek him with righteousness. Isn't that amazing? Church, this man that David is talking about is not sinless. This man is forgiven. Come on. And therefore, he receives the righteousness from God. Church, this righteousness doesn't come from himself. It doesn't come from ourselves. It's not something we can produce. How many of you guys are familiar with your Old Testament text? How righteous did the people live? How about David, though? He was pretty righteous, right? He's the one who wrote this. <laughs> He's got it in the bag, right? He can tell you, you've got to be righteous to come for the Lord, right? Come on. How'd he do? David was righteous not because of his deeds, not because his hands were clean, not because his heart was pure. Let me tell you, David had dirty hands, so dirty, in fact, God said, you can't build the temple of God. But David was righteous because he believed in the Lord, and the Lord forgave him of his sins. Come on. Church, 
The people who get blessed with righteousness from God are the ones who come in with repentance for their sin. They come in broken. They say, Lord, I don't want to be this way. I don't want to come into your house with this sin, what I did last night. I don't want to come in with the way I treated my wife this week. I don't want to come into your house this way. I need the righteousness of God to cleanse me so that I can come in before my holy maker. Come on. It's broken spirit before the Lord. It's the one who confesses their sins and comes in to the presence of God. And God says, guess what? That person, that brother, that sister, they've got clean hands. They've got a pure heart. They're not lifting up their soul to somebody else. And guess what? They're being real in the presence. They're going, God, I'm a sinner in need of a savior today. Come on. I don't have to fake it. This is who I am. I need all of who you are. Church, the question asked earlier was who can come into the presence of our sovereign king? Who can come in? Who can ascend the hill of the Lord? Church, but you know what the most beautiful thing about this text is? The question asked is, who can go up to see the king when the reality is the king has come down to us? Verse 7. Lift up your heads, O gates, And be lifted up, O ancient doors. Why? That the king of glory may come in. Can you picture this scene with me? They're calling the ark. They're opening the gates to the temple. And he says, lift up your heads. They're personified, aren't they? Lift up your heads. What does that mean? It's an idiom in Hebrew that means be confident, be bold. Why? Because the king of glory is coming in. Hallelujah. Come on, church. The king of glory is entering through these gates. Further, it means, listen, you're not going to want to miss this on your feet in reverence and awe because God of heaven is coming back to earth. Come on. The presence of the Lord is coming to fill his house. So lift your heads. And those outside the gates ask, lift your heads. And those inside say this, verse 8, who is this king of glory? Who is he? The Lord. Strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. And to build this moment, it's asked again, lift up your heads, O gates. Be bold. Be confident. And lift them up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord of hosts. Church, that's heaven's army. The Lord of heaven's army. He is the king of glory. Come on. All this repetition is to stress the main point of this psalm, which is this church, that the Lord is our glorious king whose presence is coming to us. Church, you can almost just picture the celebration going on. This is the scene, by the way, where David dances and he's undignified because God is coming back. The presence of the Lord, the symbol of the presence of God is coming back to their nation and they're just elated. They're shouting and they're singing and they're dancing. They're playing instruments. It's beautiful. And guys, it was only a symbol. (laughs) It's a symbol. Church, all of that was a shadow of things yet to come. The ark was the symbol that represented the presence of living God. But there was so much more, church, because the king was coming. (laughs) The actual king of heaven, his real, tangible presence of God was on its way, church. The presence of God took on flesh, became a child, grew to be a man, and came to dwell with his people. Come on. Jesus was coming into the world. Church, the question remains for us. Who can ascend the hill of the Lord? Who can stand in his holy place? Church, it's only the righteous, yes? Church, you and I are made righteous because there was one who did ascend the hill of the Lord. There was one who did live a righteous life in whose soul there was no deceit, truly who had clean hands and a pure heart, a heart that was zealous for his father. His name is Jesus. And let me tell you today, church, he ascended the hill of the Lord, a hill called Calvary. Jesus, it was there, church, that Jesus secured our forgiveness so that we can be called righteous. It was there that we are made righteous before God. It was there in the death of Jesus Christ that the presence of our Savior King was made open to us, church. It was there on that hill 
that heaven met earth through the death and resurrection of the King of glory, the Lord strong and mighty who came down and he did do battle. He did battle with sin and death and Satan and guess who won? And he came up out of that grave waging war on sin and death victorious and it's because of his righteous life that we can enter in with clean hands and a pure heart that we can gather as the body of Christ in the presence of our Savior today. Come on. And so we come in and we say, God, make me pure, make me holy, do your work in me so I can stand before you because I need the transformation that comes from the presence of my King. Come on. And it's here in this place. It's on that hill called Calvary that one man in Jesus, God in the flesh, walked the hill in perfect righteousness. So guess what, church? You would not have to. He did it in our place. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you came to earth as the very presence of God. You came. The ark was lost again. The representation of the presence of God was lost again because your people fell back into sin. And so, Jesus, you came to do what only you could do. We couldn't make it. Oh, we can't clean ourselves up enough. We can't purify our own hearts. We need the King of Kings. Lord, we thank you for that. Church, as you're praying here this moment, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. The first one is this. Simply this. Have you been made righteous? Have you been made righteous? See, remember the one called righteous in Psalm 32 is the one who confessed their sins to God. It's the one who's been forgiven. That's the one who's made righteous, church. So my question to you is this. Have you been forgiven? Have you confessed your sins to Almighty God, the sovereign King of the universe, the one who rules over everything, including you? Have you bowed your knee to the King of Kings? So I'm not Lord over my life. God, you're Lord over my life. You're my creator. You're my sustainer. You're the one who can make me righteous. Have you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and therefore become forgiven? Have you done that? Because if you have... You're now counted among the righteous. You're the one who's commanded now be glad and rejoice because your sin is forgiven. That's my first question. Have you been made righteous? If you don't know, I want you to come talk to me after this service. I want you to get that right with the Lord and to put your faith in Jesus Christ to become righteous and forgiven through him so you can come in and experience all that he has for you. Come into your right place in creation under him, under the King of Kings. And now for you who are believers, Here's my question to you. Are you living in that righteousness? Do do you have clean hands and a pure heart? Have you confessed any sin that has been dragging you down to Jesus? Have you given that to him today? Say, Lord, I can't live like this. I know this. Have you asked him to purify your heart so that nothing stands in the way of you worshiping in his presence? Have you done that? Are you coming into his presence clean? God, I pray over my brothers and sisters in this room right now that we'd be coming into your house clean because we're forgiven, God. Where we've started to wander again, we pray the spirit of God would draw us back in, that we would repent, we confess, and we'd say, God, we're here, we're your vessels. Would you transform us into the image of your son? Are you living in that righteousness? I want to give you a couple moments just to think and pray through that right now with the Lord. And then we're going to sing a song about the presence of God as we close today. Just pray to him right now. Do some soul searching with Jesus. Ask him in.